Violent clashes have broken out between white nationalists and counter protests. There. Vandals defaced Joining me on the Islamic phone right Center now. Long Island Church time. vandalized with satanic worship symbols Swastika and disturbing words across the building. Allow me to tell you a different story. About a place right in the center of Queens, New York, where people of varying backgrounds do get along. A place where the only thing that matters is your game. This is Utopia. I'm originally from Far Rockaway, but I live in Fresh Meadows now. It's a good, quiet neighborhood, honestly. Everybody stays to themselves pretty much, and everybody's friendly. No problems out here. I love the diversity of this area. This area is really, really diverse. Like the Asian market right there. It's just like everything is right here. It's really cool. I know it's always been a diverse park from day one. And it's just gradually and more and more diverse. I see kids getting on the bus with a basketball to come to this park to play ball. It's pretty amazing when you think about it, though. The diversity and, you know, people get on the basketball court and you all that's put aside. Whatever is race, color, religion, whatever it might be, it's just nobody, it's not in your mind. You're just there to play ball, win, have a good time. And there's, I've never seen too many problems down here. Never, never, never. It's really amazing when you think about it. While Utopia Playground is a meeting place for people of different backgrounds, it certainly wasn't intended to be. Immigrants began flooding the harbors of Ellis Island in the early 1900s, arriving in New York with hopes of creating a better life for their families and future generations. Many of those immigrants were Jews from Eastern Europe, most of whom took residency in Manhattan's Lower East Side. But after a few years, the Lower East Side became oversaturated. So in 1905, the Utopian Land Company planned to build a community of co-ops for Jewish immigrants on 50 acres of land between the communities of Jamaica and Flushing. However, having failed to secure funding, the Utopian Land Company's plan fell through. Fast forward 30 years to 1941. World War II is in full swing and the American economy is exploding. With the suburbs of Flushing, Queens growing rapidly, the Board of Education planned to use those vacant 50 acres as the site for a brand new public school. Until Robert Moses had something to say about it. Known as the master builder, Robert Moses was the driving force behind New York City's most important bridges, buildings, and highways. However, many people remembered Moses not for what he built, but for what he tore down. Thousands of minorities and low-income citizens in the inner city were displaced from their homes in order for Moses to build his many projects. In order to divert attention away from accusations of urban displacement, Moses built parks. Hundreds of parks. If he was building an urban renewal project or a highway, which people didn't really want, he would always try to have parks attached to it because he used to say, when you build a park, you're on the side of the angels. Moses was on the side of the angels when he protested the Board of Education back in 1941, claiming that the 50 acres of vacant land would be best utilized as a community park. As usual, Robert Moses got his way. In the spring of 1942, Utopia Playground was open for business. Ironically, Moses is both criticized for his displacement of minorities and lauded for his contributions to the city's parks, which all these years later have enabled New Yorkers of all backgrounds to integrate and coexist. 
Most of the playgrounds we have today, we have to give thanks to Robert Moses. People vilify Robert Moses, but under his tenure in just um, four years, we went from 100 playgrounds to 600 playgrounds overnight, like that. <laughs> Unbelievable. And he was a big believer in, in sports and um, physical activity. So the fact that there are basketball courts in every corner, practically, of New York is really a tribute to Robert Moses. I work for the Trust for Public Land. I'm a senior vice president overseeing our urban work. Playing basketball in parks was part of the fundamental part of my upbringing and development of my character and frankly gave me an insight into how people use parks that you couldn't have gotten otherwise. And you know, my ability to work across racial and demographic lines, to work across racial and religious lines and cultural lines stemmed in large measure from my upbringing on the basketball courts, the public basketball courts of New York City that, you know, was a very multiracial, multi-ethnic, uh, economically diverse crowd out there. And you learn how to get along. And I think that those kinds of interracial mixings of people are still relatively unusual in New York City. And they happen in only a couple of places. One I would say is in parks, and very particularly in basketball, because you go there and you meet a bunch of strangers and you have to form these, these friends, you have to form a, a team, you have to get the chemistry. Um, you know, we may have lousy professional basketball teams, but we're a great basketball city. And the most diverse city. Queens, New York is home to over a million foreign-born residents and 138 spoken languages, making it the most diverse urban area on the planet. Flushing in particular, struck me in terms of its religious diversity. Nowhere else had I seen um, such a dense concentration of different religious groups in a small urban residential and commercial area. Uh, and so that in itself was just striking. I think a lot of sports are places that are equalizers for uh, people of different faiths and cultures. But I think there's something about basketball in particular, especially pickup games, when you show up at a court and just want to join, join in in a game that is a bit more welcoming than almost any other sport uh, because of that particular dynamic. You do that in a place like Queens, which is the most diverse county in the country, uh, the basketball court is, it can be a reflection of, of the community. And so it, it can become this place, it is this place, where you see people getting along and uh, just playing together. Tino Pepe. I'm a student at St. John's University. I do love coming here just because I know what I'm getting. You know, I know I'm going to play three on three or four on four a half court. It's going to be competitive. It's going to be physical. It's going to make me better. I'm going to be able to get in a rhythm, talk my smack. People are going to embrace it. That whole fucking here, I'm telling you, fucking here. That's eight. That's fucking eight. A lot of parks are in New York City, man. You go there, you start talking, people get offended, and it's just like, you know, where I where I grew up, it was like talking was a part of a part of the game. On the side! Hey, shut. <laughs> hey! You know, once I get to that comfortable place where I'm rocking and everything feels like almost like I'm going to a song, um, I know that a lot of shots are gonna fall, you know, so you shoot it with confidence and that's 75% of the battle right there. It's a fucking game. I just scored fucking 16 in a motherfucking row. Fuck! Any fucking court, bro. Any fucking time, man. What the fuck I do? Basketball has been one place, not the only place, but one and the most consistent place where that, that passion and charisma, it's not judged. You know, it's embraced. We're like a lot of places, man. People are kind of looking at you like, yo, who, who's this guy? But like here, it's like, he's just a hooper. You know, and that's all I want to be. You know what I mean? I just want to be the norm. 
You know, I was an athlete growing up. You know, I was introduced to all sports. You know, I was a pretty good football player. I was a really good baseball player. And I was a, I was an, o I mean, I was an okay basketball player. But basketball was just beauty to me. You know, you get five people moving the rock, no dribbles, passes, fast break, threes, layups, and, and you get five people playing in one rhythm on the court. To me, there's never been anything more beautiful. Like from the time I'm seven years old, I don't care about a 99 yard touchdown, a 450 foot home run, but like that, fi like five people, one purpose, one rhythm. Oh my God, dude. Yes, dude. Like, oh my God, bro. I can only learn so much being around a certain brand of people. Um, so you come to Queens and you go to St. John's and it's just like, there's so many different types of people, um, different opinions, um, and you can really learn a lot about yourself and your surroundings just by, you know, interacting with someone that say in high school you would have never interacted with, you know, and it's, and, and being in Queens, it puts you in that position of uncomfortability where you got to do things and talk to people that like, you may never have before, or you may never have seen yourself before. Um, talking to someone and building a relationship with someone that barely even speaks your language. I would say that New York City has the very best relationships between the races uh, of any city in America. And I would say that's true in part because of the role, the important role that parks play for people to get together with each other. That's so powerful in New York. So that was the story of how Queens built a utopia. Question is, will the rest of the country follow suit? This is the good news perhaps for the rest of the country is that other places that are struggling with um, rapid demographic change and wondering can communities absorb religious diversity and immigration, the good news is, is they can absorb a tremendous amount of diversity and things are going to be okay.